In the previous 10 years, the inventory of industrial space couldn't keep up with demand, driven by the dual surges of the coronavirus and online shopping. To say nothing of supply chain problems that created the need to store inventory closer to end users. Vacancies have declined, rents have risen. JLL has just published a research report on the sector called The Race for Industrial Space. Joining us today to discuss some of its findings are Matab Ranhawa, JLL's America's Head of Industrial Research. Greetings, Matab. Hi, John. Thank you for having me here today. Mm -hmm. Matab, what are some of the factors that prevent industrial supply from catching up the demand? Is this more noticeable in some markets or is it, is it a national phenomenon? Um, well, you know, it's so to your first question, um, what's happening in the supply demand side of the story? We've seen a decade worth of good, strong growth in the logistics sector. Then comes the pandemic and our demand for industrial space just accelerates. Um, demand, which we were expecting to see in maybe two years, just got condensed within a period of nine months in 2020. So what that led to um, was, you know, tenants not being able to occupy spaces quickly and buildings not being able to come online. That got coupled with supply chain issues. We really didn't have um, material shortages were all across the country. Uh, buildings that could get delivered in like nine months from ground to occupant, from ground up to occupancy, starting to take like 18 months um, to deliver. So it was multiple factors that led to this big gap between supply and demand on the industrial side. Mm -hmm. So, it, and is it, this is a national issue as well. It's not just spotty, right? Correct, exactly. It's more prominent um, in a couple of markets. So like Northeast, which is on New Jersey, Eastern Central Pennsylvania, and then Southern California, which has Inland Empire and Los Angeles. Um, these are our biggest logistics markets. They are facing this challenge a little bit more than the others, but it's widespread. It's all across the country. Mm -hmm. Your report found a, a, a market sector that is pretty well saddled with a lot of old warehouses, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. So we did a good analysis here looking at, you know, average age of buildings um, built in the U.S. And what interesting facts that came out of it was 75% of our industrial product is over 20 years and older. Oh, my um, God. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, you know, 10 years from now, it's going to really be a big number, too. Um, while our construction pipeline is still very solid, we've got 500 million square feet under construction. So new buildings are coming online soon. But this this can be a concern going forward too. Mm -hmm. What's being built now? Is it mostly adaptive reuse? Is it mostly new construction? Uh, you know, are are and are buildings getting larger, smaller? What, what what give me a land give me kind of a run of the landscape here? Sure. So um, we've seen in the last 12 months, there is a significant uptick in larger buildings getting built. So a million square foot um, and larger. And I think this is a function of, you know, developers finding it so difficult to get industrial zone land now. Uh, prices are record high, whether it be land prices, um, you know, zoning is an issue as well. So the mindset is that, you know, if you can get your land, let's just maximize it you know, get higher economies um, of scale to get like a bigger building in. Mm. Um, I just wrote a story, in fact, about a, uh, a development in Kansas City that mm -hmm. is going to have, it's going to be 18 million square feet over 27 buildings near the, uh, near the Kansas City airport. So that, that shows you the dimension of what people are looking at here for this industrial space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. You know, again, like I said, demand is pretty strong in a lot of these markets. In fact, if you look from a numbers perspective, Los Angeles and Inland Empire, like I said, one of the biggest industrial markets globally, they're under 1% vacant. So there is really no space for a tenant looking to expand or looking to relocate and move to that market. Mm -hmm. Your report also touches on the, the phenomenon of multi-story warehouses. Can you talk a little bit about that and where they're most appropriate or where they're most uh, evident? Yeah, sure. You know, um, John, multi-story warehouses have been extremely common in Europe, Asia as well. If you see Singapore, Hong Kong, you know, London, a lot of these markets have had multi-story warehouses for a while. And what's really driven um, that concept here in the United States as well is the rise of e-commerce. Um, there is that need for people to yeah. get packages 
as soon as possible. Like consumer expectations have changed. That's really pushed for these traditional warehouses, which would typically be located outside city centers to get closer and closer to where people actually live. And that space is difficult to find. So the only option left is to go vertical. Um, so from your question on where, we did see our first multi-story warehouse come up in Seattle. There are a few projects in New York as well. Um, and this is, again, going to be applicable more in you know, big metropolitan areas with big downtown districts where people actually live. Did you examine at all in your report whether or not a multi-story warehouse is more or less difficult to manage and run? It is an expensive project to build. That's why we're not seeing so much of it. Um, also from a structural perspective, think of it like, you know, we're trying to get trucks to level one, level two with cargo on it. So it is a complicated long-term project to build versus a typical warehouse box that you can, you know, just bring up in the city outskirts, maybe one million square feet or 500,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of layers of complexity involved around that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was struck by how the industrial construction mirrors the population migration in the United States, where a lot of what's being built is in the South, in the Sun Belt. Uh, and I was wondering if you might be able to elaborate on it a little bit for us. Yeah, absolutely. I live in the Carolinas, so part of the Sun Belt market. And I can see a lot of people are migrating, as we all know, to the Sun Belt area. So what does that mean? Where people move, you've got to have your logistics facilities come by closer to people again. Um, E-commerce is one function of it. But then again, a lot of home building, houses are being built in the Sun Belt as well, uh, which is also having a lot of you know, carpet tile manufacturers come in. Your companies like UPS and FedEx, which are distributing and getting that package to your doorstep, they also are looking to move more towards this area. We've interestingly seen a lot of manufacturing announcements here as well due to the availability of labor and land yeah. too. Mm. What's JLL's prognosis for this sector? And um, what factors could either impede that growth or accelerate it? You know, we're at a very interesting time right now. Like I said, you know, this did not happen because of COVID. We had been seeing 10 plus years of very strong industrial growth and our trends just got accelerated in the last 24 months. So the gap between supply and demand is really wide right now. We need mm -hmm. to narrow that and bring it to healthy levels. Um, we need to have more buildings come online and then you know, tenants need to have a little bit more options to choose from. So overall, we do continue to remain bullish on the sector, but that we need to balance it to healthy levels, like I mentioned. Mm -hmm. Your report kind of portrays the sector as sort of an infill play with larger buildings dominating more and more. What happens to the, all the, the older buildings that you cite? I mean, are they being turning into something else? You know, there's a lot of opportunity on older assets. Now, I think there is still value in these Class B and Class C assets because there are users that still want that kind of space as industrial rents get expensive and, you know, it gets difficult to get land as well. But there is a strong demand for modern facilities. When you look at e-commerce companies, when you look at your distribution companies, they want to get packages in and out as quickly as possible from a warehouse. And they also want to be able to stack more goods within a facility. So one of the trends we're seeing in terms of building design is higher clear heights as well. So while there is a very strong demand for class A facilities, there is a very strong user group that is still interested in using this class B and class C asset space. But again, as buildings get older, there is you know, going to be a higher need to make these buildings more efficient to still be able to function well for the clients and companies. On the new construction and the adaptive reuse, have you seen any evidence of mixed use components finding their way into it? Like, you know, retail or <laughs> food and beverage or whatever. Yeah. So, you know, again, coming back to the building amenities portion, um, there is a strong focus on retaining labor. Labor is, again, a big issue, as we all know. So industrial facilities are looking into how can we make our buildings um, nicer and you know, bring in more amenities for our labor. It's again, it comes back to the zoning issue um, as well of having a mixed use facility fit in. But we have seen and within the last mile space, you know, very small um, last mile service centers come up to be able to service again the population. 
Speaking of zoning, uh, do most municipalities have zoning in place for this type of building, or is this something a relatively new phenomenon for, for some places, particularly in the South? It is um, newer in some places, and it takes a little bit of you know guidance and educating people on what industrial buildings are as well. To be honest, you know, there is still that mindset that industrial is not the nicest product. It's, you know, a dirty old warehouse. So there is a lot of education to be done in terms of educating communities that, you know, this brings in jobs, this brings in labor. And again, this is becoming one of those necessary sectors because, like I said, consumer expectations. We do want our goods to come in within a day. That's only possible when you have a facility to service you close by. Mateb, thanks for taking a couple of minutes to talk to me about this. Sure. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. And thanks to our audience for joining us. This is John Caulfield from Building Design and Construction.